Today, I'm going to talk about the ACT model and CSP, which is short for Communicating Sequential Processes Concurrency by using Alex and Clojure as examples. But I will also do a bit of comparison between the BIM VM and JVM because when you look at the implementation of the concurrency models, you cannot talk about it without looking at the underlying runtime that enables those concurrency models. Um, so uh, you may notice that. So yeah, this is this is uh, sounds quite ambitious, right? I'll try to cover as much as possible in half an hour. I'd be really happy if you can take something interesting away at the end of the talk. And. Uh, before I start, you may note that um, this was not the original talk on the schedule. So what happened was that the original speaker couldn't make it, unfortunately. And I did this talk uh, three weeks ago at CodeBeam Stockholm. So I was asked to do this talk here, but remotely. Um, so yeah, I just hope I still remember as much as possible from, from what I did three weeks ago. Um, first, a bit about myself. I'm based in Berlin. Uh, Germany. I work for Remote, the company. So our whole code base in backend is in Elixir, and we have more than 50 engineering backend engineers already. This is a really interesting journey to work with so many people on the Elixir code base, pure Elixir code base. I block small things on my blog, and I also have a Twitter account, which I really should start using more often from now on. So uh, a bit about the talk. I am an Elixir developer in my day job. So first a disclaimer, I'm not an expert on any of these things. I'm not an expert on CSP, on Clojure or JVM, whatever. I was just very intrigued by the topic and I did some research into it and I would like to share my learnings with the fellow developers. And there might be folks in the audience that know much more about JVM and Clojure and CSP than I do. And there might be mistakes in my talk. So if there are, please point them out. I'm also learning together with you. Uh, so as I said, there'll be two dimensions of comparison. The first dimension is Beam, versus the uh, Allen runtime system versus the JVM, and then the Act model versus the CSP. And this is the outline of the talk. First, uh, I'm going to have a, a foundational overview of Beam versus JVM. Some of the topics I will cover include per-process memory space, the isolated memory versus shared memory, and preemptive scheduling versus uh, scheduling relying on the OS rather than the scheduler. And what are the performance implications of those things? And then I will take a look at the actor model versus CSP from a theoretical perspective. Uh, for example, in the actor model, we have first class processes, but in the CSP, we have first class channels. And in the actor model, we have asynchronous send, but in CSP, you have synchronous write by default. And we have unlimited mailbox in the, at least the beam implementation of the actor model, but we have limited buffer in closure, uh, core sync. And I will do a brief walkthrough of the actor model and process on the beam, which I think many of you are already familiar with, so I'll not spend a lot of time on this. Um, then I will spend most of my time on the walkthrough and actual example of CSP and its implementation in Clojure's core sync library, which um, uh, in detail, I will first go through the simplest topology, which is one channel, one writer and one reader. And then I will go into some different topologies and buffer types that are also possible. And in the end, there's actually something very interesting about uh, the CSP implementation in Core Sync, which is it can either use real JVM threads using the thread keyword, or it can use a Go keyword, which is more like an inversion of control threads, uh, light, more lightweight. And we'll see how it, how, what the behavior differences and performance differences are between those two. And so that's actually also one final twist in the story while I was researching this topic that was really interesting. And I think we'll shed some new perspective and food for thought on this topic. If you want to find out, uh, stay with me until the end of the talk. Okay, so the first part is the Beam versus the JVM. Um, I think the very foundational part of the Elon runtime system is the memory space of each process is isolated from each other. Let's take a look at this graph. So as we can see, we have many different processes and each process has its own heap space. So the heap space is totally not shared with any other process. And the, as a result, the garbage collection can simply happen at each process independently. And usually the heap space is pretty small, uh, no, definitely no bigger than one megabyte. The, uh, as a result, the garbage collection will not stop the world. So it will not impact any other processes. And one, one interesting implementation I think you'll know is uh, larger binaries are actually stored in a separate space so that they can be shared by different processes, don't have to live in the heap space. 
And this facilitates the actor model, as we will see later, this independent memory space. And another very interesting feature is preemptive scheduling, uh, which is pretty distinct. And what does it mean? So whenever we start IEX or URL, we, we see this line actually in the command line. And this SMP part, it actually indicates the number of schedulers, which is usually the same as the number of CPU calls you have on the, on the computer. And what happens is that each scheduler has a separate process queue. And this is actually something that evolved over time, as we can see in this graph. Uh, at OTP release 13, finally, there's a true multi-core support. So each CPU call would get a separate scheduler and a, a run queue would have a number of processes on each scheduler, which is, uh, I'm going to talk in more detail later. So, and also you can see how the processes are load balanced across the schedulers. What it means is, for example, if the scheduler four finds itself out of processes, it will actually try to steal processes from the other schedulers to run so that it's as balanced as possible. And what does preemptive scheduling mean? So once each process runs for, I think the amount I remember lastly was 4,000 reductions, it will actually get put to the back of the queue and another process will run in its place. Uh, what does reduction count mean? One reduction count is approximately one function call. Uh, there are also some other actuals that count as reduction count, which I'm not going into detail. But this is a very interesting feature. So there's no process that can say, I have a really long running request. I hawk the resource, I just not let go, but this will not be possible because the scheduler on the VM level itself will simply put the process to the back of the queue and another process will then get to the front of the queue. And as a result, we have really consistent time sharing across all the processes. Uh, this is how, for example, if you have 1 million processes running on a BMBM, you can still be pretty confident that the performance, the, the number it takes to, to, to uh, deal with a request for each of the process is pretty consistent across the board because they will all get the same treatment from the schedule. They will all got, get put to the back of the queue. Once they have run a certain number of reductions, they will not just run there forever. And um, uh, of course, as a natural consequence of this, uh, the Beam VM might not be as powerful for task demanding intensive processing power, uh, because of course we have preemptive scheduling that the process will have to be put back onto the back of the queue. And another factor is dynamic typing, which results in some runtime overhead. So you have to, uh, the VM will actually have to check whether the type is correct, whether, whether uh, this thing is valid. Well, for a statically typed language, you don't need to do that. You just have to do that at compile time. So uh, on a beam, if you want to do some intensive processing power, you would usually use uh, native implemented functions, which is run on dirty schedulers. Actually, it's a separate part, as we can see here, as we launch the IEX or EIL. Uh, this is for NIFs and BIFs. Or we can also use ports to communicate with external processes for such purposes. But one thing to note is that NIFs then are not subject to preemptive scheduling because they are essentially foreign functions. So if you have to be really careful with the NIFs, otherwise they can block uh, this scheduler here. Okay, so now I'm going to take a look at the JVM. Uh, I think one very important feature of JVM we all know is the heap space and memory space is shared by all the threads. And you can modify the memory space pretty freely. And this is called share state concurrency. But as a natural consequence, if you do a garbage collection, you could then, of course, result in, in could impact all the other threads, even though they might not be doing something related to this thread, because the whole memory space is shared. As you can see here, this is a heap on a JVM. And this, it can do a minor garbage collection or a major garbage collection. But the important thing is the whole heap will be impacted as a result. Uh, I have to say that uh, a lot of optimizations have made on this front. I think some people familiar with JVM will be quick to point out that this really isn't such a big problem as it theoretically can be. JVM is uh, marvelous in terms of the how it's engineered. It has a lot of manpower going into optimization. But yeah, um, the heap space is very different from the beam. And also, when you spawn a thread in the JVM, it actually just uses operating system threads and relies on the OS scheduler, which means very different to Beam. You don't have a VM level Beam preemptive schedule. And this, as a result, threads are heavy because the operating system threads. And if you 
have to do some frequent blocking and unblocking of this of some operations on the thread, it will be costly because the OS would then have to block and unblock it. And you have to also take care to not unexpectedly cause deadlocks because if a thread does something and the other threads are waiting on that, it can be it can cause an impasse. But then, of course, as a result, it's very performant and heavy sustained workloads. Okay, so uh, you you will see how the characteristics of the virtual machines are also related to the concurrency model. I'm going to talk next. But first, I'm going to talk a bit about the actor model and the processes on the beam. The actor model was first proposed by Havid in 1973. And I think an interesting fact a lot of you know is that Elon actually independently arrived at a similar implementation. The team didn't read this paper. They, they were just trying to solve a very concrete business need from Ericsson. And they realized this is a very good way to do it. So I guess this is kind of a testament to how good this model is for this kind of problem. And one very important part of the actor model is that name processes will communicate with each other by message passing. Um, so every process has a name and they can find each other by the name directly. Uh, we'll see the contrast with uh, uh, CSP later. And another interesting part is um, uh, on the Beam VM, a process cannot refuse to receive messages. Uh, it will just get a message. You have, you have to define how to act on the message. I think if I'm not mistaken, you can just simply keep sending a message to a mailbox until the memory overflows. This is actually possible. Yeah. So a theoretically unlimited amount of messages are storable. And by default, the send operation is non-blocking. You can send and forget where the receive operation is blocking. Uh, we'll see in the example later uh, what exactly means. So this is example, a uh, very simple example, actually from just from the Elixir official guide. Um, as you can see here, uh, we, we launched the IEX and we started a process. Uh, we, we get a reference to the IEX process. And then we spawn another process, which whose task is to send a message to this IEX parent process. There is a hello and PID of that process. And note that before I do anything, before I do the receive block, this message is actually already in the inbox of the first of, of the parent pro of the receiver process. So this means you cannot refuse to receive a message. If you send a message, you have to receive it. And now I enter the receive block. I try to pattern match against this message and then I print this message, which then removes the message from the inbox. But if I do something like a random match, which is not what we actually received, the IEX process will simply just wait forever. Uh, of course, we can, uh, uh, in, in real programming, we, we will probably escape that by timeouts and various mechanisms. But if you just simply do a receive, it will just be blocked. But note that how, note how the sender will just send a message and oblivious to whether the message arrived at a destination or not. So in the actor model, the sender will just always send the message. Theoretically, the message can take forever to arrive, take a very long time to arrive or never arrive. It doesn't concern the sender. It's always asynchronous. And as an as as aside, um, of course, we know that L and ODP is a whole package of things, not just the actor model itself. We have abstractions such as gen server, which like this is which is the reason why we almost never write receive manually nowadays, because a lot of corner cases to actually take care of. And we have supervision trees, we have node clustering, uh, location transparency, we have debugging tools, tracing tools, and other features, and also other features, but I'm not going to detail, of course. Just mention that this is part of the OTP package that we have here. Okay, so now I'm going to introduce. CSP and core sync in closure. Um, first, uh, I make, I'd like to make another disclaimer, which is some closure programmer, they might say, well, core sync really isn't the conventional closure approach to concurrency. So actually when closure came out, the model it adopted is something called software transactional memory, STM. And the gist of it is it still allows shared state concurrency but there's no need for explicit locking mechanism like we have to do in Java. Uh, simpl as simplified, it, it can be seen as like a series of reads and writes will happen in a transaction similar to a database transaction. And then you can uh, retry the transaction and coordinate the transactions, et cetera. There are actually four reference types. 
um, which differ depending on factors, like whether the thing is thread local or asynchronous or not. But I will not go into the details here because this is not the topic of today's talk. Um, and Core Sync was released as an additional closure library in 2013. It was actually six years after Clojure's initial release. That was a pretty long time. And it was much inspired by Go's implementation of a CSV. Um, the actually, the, a, very, a very cool fact about the CSP in, uh, in Clojure's Core Sync is it actually has two types of so called processes. One is a type that uses ordinary JVM threads. And the other one is something called Go, which is more similar to lightweight Go routines. And we'll look, take a, have a look at an example later. OK, so what is actually CSP first? Um, it was something originally proposed by Hall in 1978, but it has evolved substantially. If you're interested, you can take a look at the original paper. I was pretty surprised to find out that the original idea bears certain similarities to the actor model we just discussed. Uh, for example, the processes can be named, but that is not how it is nowadays. So in the implementation in Golan and Clojure, processes will pass messages to each other via channels, uh, which means channels are actually first class citizens, while the processes are anonymous, but the channels are named. The channels have a name and you can always refer to them by the name. And another very interesting theoretical property is it's blocking and synchronous by default. Remember how the send operation in the actor model is asynchronous, so you can um, send and forget. But in the C in the default implementation of CSP, both writing and reading are synchronous and blocking. Uh, there are variants such as buffer channels, which enable non-blocking behavior to some extent. Uh, we'll see some examples later. And also, you can explicitly close the channel to further writes. So it's not like in the actor model where the receiver can only have to receive the messages and define how to react to the messages. Um, and I think this is one interesting observation I found here. I hope this is correct, which is in Gola and Clojure, CSP can still facilitate working on shared memory, but actor model as it's implemented on Beam and even ARCA, which is another implementation on the JVM, it doesn't want you to do that. So let's look at some quotes. Uh, in Go lines, the, uh, the quote is, you don't communicate by sharing memory, but you share memory by communicating. Uh, from what I understand, what happens is that the sender process can send the reference to some data structure via the CSV channel to the receiver process, and it will then do some work on that, channel, on that uh, data structure that was shared by the sender process. And the sender will have to make sure it doesn't modify this data structure anymore later, but it still can. It's just, you're not supposed to modify it and the receiver is supposed to modify it. And Rich Hickey actually said explicitly that Clojure's mechanism for concurrent use of state remains vi viable and channels are more oriented towards the flow aspects of a system. So he doesn't want to invalidate the concurrent modification of state in Clojure. Well, when we look at the ACA documentation, it's very explicit that messages should be immutable. You should avoid shared mutable state. And, but there's no way on JVM to prevent it, right? Because JVM, in essence, you can modify the state. So if you're not careful in ARCA, you can lead to some really weird bugs when you expose internal state to other processes, which is not possible on the BEAM. And BEAM has isolated processes, as we just saw. Okay, so now I'm going to walk through an example in Clojure. Uh, first, I'll start with the uh, simplest topology, which is one reader, one writer, and the blocking channel. Um, first, we will initialize the channel with, we, we, we give it a name called C, so the channel is out there. And we try to spawn a thread using the thread keyword, which puts a hello message into the channel. And note how I also want to print a message after that but the message will not get printed because it now has to wait for somebody to read from the channel, which is not the same as we saw in, with the actor model. And now as we spawn another reader thread, which takes from the channel and prints what it takes from the channel. It will uh, run another JVM thread, it will take the hello from the channel, and then it will print hello. And after this point, Writer will now get unblocked and it will now print writer unblocked. So to recap, 
a writer first puts hello onto the channel and a reader reads from the channel. And after that, writer can go on to do whatever else it plan to do. So the output will be hello and writer unblocked. The, the reader can also try reading first and get blocked. So the, the order can be uh, the other way around because it's both blocking and synchronous on both the writer and the reader side. So it's the same example, we initialize the channel. We try to read from the channel, but there's no message in the channel. So uh, the reader will not proceed. It will wait on some message to be available in the channel. And now we have a writer thread to put the message into the channel. After that, the reader sees the message and gets the message. Now it gets unblocked and uh, proceeds. So the output will be then hello and reader unblocked similarly. And as you can see that we can also close the channel. Uh, after it's closed, it will no longer accept any writes, but the data can still be read. So in an example, we put the message into the channel and we close it. So it cannot be written to anymore. But after that, we read from the channel and we get a message, which is still available. This is another demonstration of how channels are really first class in this model, but because the channel is still there, it can be read from until it doesn't have any messages anymore. Uh, there are other potential topologies with CSP. For example, you can have multiple readers listening to the same channel. Um, in this case, a message will only be taken once by at most one reader. So if reader two gets a message, reader one, reader three will not get the same message. And you can have multiple writers and one reader, in which case, for example, if writer three writes a message to the channel, the channel is full, it's blocked. And writer one and writer two will not be able to write to the channel until somebody comes in and uh, reads a message. After which, uh, for example, writer one might write to the channel and writer two will get blocked again uh, because still the channel is not free. So this is very distinct characteristic where the channel has the capacity for um, one message. And you can also read from multiple channels. Uh, in core async, it's called outs. I think in go line, it's called select, which will just select on the channel that first receives the message. So if channel two first receives the message, the reader will get this message from channel two and do something uh, with it uh, in this statement. Um, but we can make channels non-blocking, which uh, one way to achieve it is to have a buffered channel which uh, size greater than one. Um, for example, here I have a buffer channel of size 10 and the writer can simply keep writing to the channel, just like how you send messages from Beam in, uh, in, in, Beam, in Beam processes. And before the buffer is full, the writer can just write and forget. Uh, it, will, it can continue doing whatever it wants to do. And theoretically you can have sliding and dropping buffer, in which case the writer can then keep going forever. But it's not a real unlimited buffer. Note the difference uh, with a sliding or dropping buffer. After 10 messages are received, the 11th message will replace either the first message or the 10th, or the 10th message. So there have been some per pull requests for closure to implement unlimited buffer in core sync. But Rich Hickey totally hated that. He refused all of them. Um, and this is something really cool um, with CoaSync, with the Go macro. So recall how we really don't want to spawn a lot of JVM threads. We can then use Go instead of thread keyword. It basically uses a fixed size thread put under the hood and it will switch the processes in and out of threads as they become block and unblock in a kind of a state machine manner. It's similar to C sharp async and therefore also I can, we can regard it as somewhat similar to ES6 async await. And the interesting fact is Clojure is supposed to be a platform agnostic. It has a JVM implementation. It also has Clojure script. And core async, it also works on Clojure script, but the only way to make it work on Clojure async is to use the Go variant because of how the node runtime is single threaded. It will not be able to spawn actual thread. So you can use the Go variant still on the node environment for Clojure script. And there's some macro magic under the hood, which transforms according to a state machine, which is super complicated. If you're interested, you can take a look at the source code. I'm not going to show it here. But yeah, and this is a simple. This is a, this is an example of spawning 1,000 Go processes to write to 1,000 channels. 
I'm not going to go line by line, but basically what it does is we have 1,000 channels and we spawn 1,000 ghost rats to write high to the channels and we read from the channels. And if we time it, it's uh, done in 200 milliseconds, which is pretty good. If you do it using the actual OS thread, it will be much heavier. This is an example from the core sync repo. Okay, so what is the other twist in the story I was talking about in the beginning? Um, this I didn't know, of course, I think many people already know if they are familiar with JVM, but basically JVM will also have virtual threads and lightweight threads coming to JDK 19, which will be released later this year already. And they, in the proposal, they mentioned explicitly goal routines and alarm processes as inspirations, which is super interesting. Uh, it doesn't have a built-in CSP mechanism. It will, because um, I think the main purpose is to enable doing um, lightweight work without having to use actual OS threads. But it, uh, we can, as we can see later, some libraries might make use of this to implement the CSP or actor model. Uh, which I mentioned at the end. So this could have a huge impact on the concurrency in the JVM world. People say it might be the most exciting feature to come to JVM in a long while. And what will happen to core sync after that? Do we still need a Go macro to do the transformation or should we actually use the virtual threads? And people are, are doing some, or should we go for some other concurrency model? People don't actually know yet. I asked a question on the closure Slack and in the chat forum, there are many different opinions and speculations. But I think one thing that makes sense is core sync will still be backward compatible with old JDK versions for a while, because closure is pretty big on backwards compatibility. So the, this implementation of the Go macro will still be available for a while. And yeah, the pro project room is very interesting because it could hopefully lower the bar for libraries that implement different concurrency patterns on a JVM. Uh, JVM is a huge ecosystem. So there are already tons of existing libraries such as Akka, Quasar, uh, Quasi is something that implements kind of lightweight processes similar to um, what we have on Beam. And there's even a CSP implementation with JCSP. But in order to really get this kind of lightweight processing thing, kind of thing working, they tend to have to perform certain hacks, even on the bytecode level, to, to really make it work because JVM doesn't support it. From what I get, uh, many people involved in the Quasi project, they're also involved in Project Loom. So after this thing is shipped, we can hopefully see uh, the, the bar being lowered for all kinds of concurrency patterns being implemented on the JVM. And I think it's just a, in general very interesting to see how even JVM thinks it needs this virtual thread, lightweight thread. I think this is, um, so this is a trend that is, it benefits a lot of the runtime. People can see it. So yeah, um, this is the, the end of my talk. It was originally 25 minutes in the code beam. I think it now it took about 30 minutes. So hopefully you can still have some time for the questions. Thank you. Yeah, so giving a talk remotely is hard. Uh, doing it last minute is extra hard. And I think you did a fantastic job. So thank you very much for that. Thank you. Um, so we have a Q&A session. Um, I've seen we have one question from Simon. I'm not sure if you're in the room or remote. Uh, if you're remote, please unmute and um, turn on your video so we can see you and hear your question. Please go ahead, Simon. Yeah. Step forward. <laughs> well, uh, I just wanted to ask, so based on uh, the actor model and CSP, where do you think it would be appropriate to use one over the other? Yeah, so, um, thanks for the question. I've also been thinking about what would be the trade-offs between those two systems. But I think as I did, as I was researching this topic, I realized you really cannot look at those patterns without looking at the underlying VM. Because theoretically speaking, I think the actor model and the CSP, they can be kind of uh, complements to each other. So theoretically you can implement one in the other using some ways. For example, if you want a channel uh, with the actor model, you can have an actor in between that routes the messages to different other actors. And 
And Rich Hickey, he said he doesn't think the actor model is the right way to go. But I, uh, but I think when you look at the statement, you have to look at the properties of the underlying virtual machine. Uh, as we saw in, in Golan and the closure, we can actually still do shared state concurrency with CSP. While with the pure actor model in Elon and in Beam and also even in the Acre, they really discourage that. So I guess it kind of also depends on the um, it de depends on what kind of problem you're trying to tackle. If I'm writing a high concurrency system, I think Elixir and Beam is a very good choice. And if I have to do some more heavy computation, which involves shared memory, I would then look at the other way. Okay, thank you. Um, I have also one final question. Um, so the Beam is very well known for its observability. So you can actually inspect processes and see which messages it get, et cetera. How is that when you're using CSP? Is the observability just as good? Can you debug a slow process? Thanks, that's a very good question. Uh, I think in, in CSP, what, what's... Hey, uh, yeah. yeah, so um, I, I'm, not, I'm not an expert on this. I'm not an expert on this topic, but uh, from what I understand, uh, in CSP, the very a very this core distinction is how you have channels as first class citizens. And I actually had a very interesting conversation with somebody after the talk in Code Beam. He said he has a professor who does resource researches on programming languages, and he actually prefers CSP to actor in terms of uh, proving the properties of the system and things. I guess because it's totally blocking, right? So if you don't consider the variants like buffered CS, buffer channels and things, you can very well deduct the properties of when the writes will be blocked, when it will be unblocked, and what will be the interaction between the writer and the readers. Well, for the actor model, it could even be a bit more complicated because um, the, the, the sender can just send and forget, and there's no guarantee that the message will arrive at the destination. So yeah, sometimes it could be a headache to debug the flow of the messages. But yeah, I'm, I'm not an expert on this topic. I'm sure somebody who has a lot of experience with Scola and Clojure, they might have more to say about it, but I would imagine they also have good tools to deal with this aspect. Okay, cool. Do we have any questions from the audience here? Going once, you? Okay, step forward, please. Okay, if I got a question uh, right, why don't we use rabbits in if we want to use CSP with the beam? Did I get the question right? Okay. Yeah, I think um, people wouldn't want to use CSP on the beam, right? Uh, the beam is very tightly coupled to this message passing of actor model. So yeah, if you, if you want to have queues, usually also people wouldn't try to manually simulate the behavior of a CSP by using another process in between. You can do it. But as you said, Rabbit and things are better choices. But on the other hand, if you want to do actor on the JVM, it could be more, more complicated. Like what Arca tries to warn people not to expose internal state. It has to be warned and not built into the system. So I think it totally makes sense. Like if you want to use queues, of course, you can use external queue systems if your system is under beam. OK, cool. Uh, thank you very much. We have about 10 minutes break till 11.35. Then we're going to get our crowd together. Uh, but before we leave this room, please give a very warm applause. <laughs> <laughs>